All right, folks. We'll have some Bible study here for a few minutes. Now I know why people come. They come for the music. So. And I think, I think, uh, I think uh, yeah, that's right. You all come for the preaching. They come for the music. So we'll do the, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 138 tonight. That's where we'll be. Uh, we didn't need to pray for uh, the Mosleys. They were both uh, running fever. They went to a wedding yesterday, and they were on their way home with a fever. And uh, I told uh, Bart and Amy, go ahead and take the night off because they drove all night coming back from Lubbock after that softball game uh, that their daughter's in. And now they're two games away from a state final. So that's amazing. That's, that's quite an achievement for any sports, high school sports in the state of Texas. When you're moving up that high, you're doing really well, and um, it's an exciting thing. All right, so this is where we'll be in Psalm 138. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to look at uh, just uh, three verses here in this passage in Psalm 138. Father God, again, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the privilege of gathering again around your word. And Lord, for those who join us online, we welcome them, and we pray your blessings on them as well as for us in this room. And that what we talk about and look at tonight, that you'll speak to our hearts and help us to understand better your great will for our lives and your tremendous grace and blessing that's bestowed upon each of us. Help us, Lord, to always relax in your grace, but never take it for granted. Help us to realize the freedom that you've given us in Christ. And at the same time, the desire and motivation of our heart should be to serve him. And I pray, Lord, you put that deep within us. As our coming Vacation Bible School approaches, we pray, Lord, that we will have things in order here and that we will be able to reach many in the community of these children and help them to know the love and goodness of Jesus. We ask it in his holy name. Amen. Okay, we're going to be in 138 for just a few moments. Uh, this is... Um, a longer uh, uh, psalm. It has eight, but each of the verses are rather long. If you go back and look at uh, uh, Psalm 136, where we were just the other night, we talked about His mercy endures forever, and we're going to roll over and look at 138, just one between them, that's going to talk a great deal about uh, how that mercy transforms and changes our lives. Uh, psalm 137 is, uh, and 138 are tied in the fact that they're complementary of the other. 137 deals with Israel being in captivity in Babylon and what happened to them as a nation and the fact that they went in through great grief and sorrow after they lost their country. Uh, this is what I'm concerned about for us as Americans we have a generation of young people today who have no real deep appreciation for this nation and what its foundation was built upon. And if we look at how we are today, we're far from what the founding fathers had in mind and the way things are being conducted. The, just the lifestyle of the citizens, but also the way that they interpret the Constitution and the way they do not interpret the Constitution. Uh, both would be, I think, of great grief to the founding fathers. As a matter of fact, you hardly ever hear any references to them anymore. Uh, they're not referred to as founding fathers anymore. Some of them are on our currency, but uh, they've even changed some of that with some of the currency, uh, coins and things of that nature, taking them off. And uh, what happens, as we've talked about before, when you forget your history, you forget where you came from, then you don't know who you are in the present situation. And that's why Israel has always remained strong as a nation, a resilience to come back together. Even though they, they lose their vision or they lose their walk with the Lord, they're constantly reminded when they come back to the Scripture of their history. Just think, their history is a part of the Bible, and the Bible is a part of their history. I mean, it, it is their history. And so when they look at the Scripture and they read it, they're constantly reminded of where they came from and who they are. We don't have that as Americans. You got to go in a classroom and learn the history of your country. And unfortunately, a lot of these schools today are not teaching uh, the basics of our history, just basic things. 
and uh, they get off into social experimentation and everything else. They get away from, then they interpret things. Uh, they only look at uh, post-Civil War history. Uh, sometimes they don't look at the foundation, and then they get focused on one thing, and uh, a lot of them are, are, are focused only on the question of slavery, but it was one of many things that was a, a factor in the development of our country. And so in the Hebrew people, it, especially when you look at the Psalms, David always pins out all of the details of their history and where they are. So Psalm 137 is the regret, the remorse of losing their country and being plundered by these Gentiles of, of Babylon. And it said in verse 1 that they sat down, they wept, and we remembered Zion. We remembered Jerusalem. We remember what life used to be and all of its benefits of being free people in our land. And now it's gone. It says we hung up our hearts, verse 2, upon the willows in the midst of it. There was nothing to sing about. They were, their sorrow, their song was gone. And our song will be gone if we lose this country. And we need to be praying diligently for our nation. We need to be praying for a revival in our churches and that that revival will spill over into a great awakening for our land again. We need very much that land to be, uh, our land to be touched by the grace and presence of God. We need a generation of people to come back to the knowledge and recognition of the Lord Jesus. But we're deluded with a lot of other things now. One of them being atheism, which is just a terrible thing. Well, when you look at Psalm 137 and the fact that they were in, imprisoned and they lost their land, they lost the freedom to worship, uh, they were captives, and their, their praise turned to songs of dirges and, and sadness. And it says, uh, uh, they ask us uh, for a song as they plundered us, it says in verse 3. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, they said, mocking them. Sing us to your worship songs as we plunder your nation. We take everything away from you while you watch us pillage the land before your eyes. And, of course, Lamentations talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and all the horrors that went with it. And, and in, in the whole Psalm 137 is the sadness of being plundered and destroyed by the enemy and that their nation is gone. What they knew, what they had, the way of life is all gone. Everything has left their sight. And everything has been destroyed. But even uh, there, though, we find in Psalm 138, the Lord's goodness to those who are faithful. He's always blessing a faithful remnant. So the question is, with this lesson tonight, is do you have a whole heart? Or a whole heart? Do you have a whole heart that is a complete heart? Or do you have a whole heart that is have a hole in your heart? Is there a hole in your heart? One, Psalm 137 is describing the people who have a hole in their heart at that point. Uh, there's sorrow. There's emptiness. Uh, there's a sadness. There's a grief. They've lost everything. It's gone. And they drifted so far from the Lord and they didn't even realize how bad it was going to be. And it's worse than they imagined once it happened. And there's a lot of people who are dancing on the head of a pen right now that this nation will be just fine. We won't have any troubles, but we're in great peril, and we need to pray for America because people do not understand the price of freedom. They do not understand how, how any republic or democracy, a democracy chooses who runs our republic, but how fragile a government can be and the fact that we need to be prepared and ready to defend it. And, um, and make just a few bad choices. So let's take a look at a whole heart or a whole heart. Uh, verse 1, uh, we see the redemption of the people in, uh, in the midst. We see the faithfulness of the, of, the, of the faithful remnant and the redemption of the people. He says in verse 1, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods I will sing praises to you. This goes back to Psalm 137. They're in the land of Babylon. They're surrounded by false gods. And they're, they're, they're looking at an environment that's filled with strange ideas, strange gods, strange philosophies. They're now uh, in the midst, deluded in the midst of all of these uh, pagan Gentiles and their pagan gods and their pagan religions and their pagan um, insights of how to live. 
That's why Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel said, we will not eat the king's dainty meats. We're going to separate ourselves. We're going to stay on kosher food, what we know. We're going to keep our culture within us. We're not going to dilute ourselves with uh, all the expensive, extravagant eating and dietary ways of the Babylonians. We don't want to get diluted because the first thing you want to do is change your appetite. You change your physical appetite, you'll change your emotional appetite. Change your emotional appetite, you change everything about a person's appetite. So it was a way to uh, try to break Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, trying to get them to eat these dainty meats in Babylon is to change their appetites. It's what television does. If you look, you go back and watch the old original television programs, and they didn't even let a, a man and a woman sleep in the same bed on TV, even though they're supposed to be married and have kids and families. They didn't share a bed on TV. That was nothing. Now, you've got to be careful what your kids are flipping through the channels because there's full nudity available on television on some certain channels on free TV and all the profanity that you want to hear. And if you look at the children today, a lot of them uh, are very fluent in profanity. Uh, we've become a much more profane nation because we've lost our way and our values and our, and our ethics and um, uh, our arts. Our arts always reflect what we've become. Not, and they, they call all this uh, pagan-type music and everything that they sing today on the radio as art. And it's just, it's filth. And some of it's just, ex it's just pornography put to music. It's awful. And um, so they, they, well, our nation has been deluded by the gods of this world and idolatry and all these things. But this is a faithful remnant. And he says, I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. In other words, I'm going to be counterculture. See, to be, be in the culture of Christ is to be counterculture with the world. So that's the first thing we see is that whole hearts, that is a, a, a complete heart, W-H-O-L-E, a whole heart uh, will sing praises. They'll sing praises. And those praises, those songs are always counterculture to the world we presently live in. And that's why the crazier a culture becomes, the more the contrast is to the Christ culture. And so the Christ culture is always the culture that we live, but the further the world comes, goes from Christ culture, the more we stand out without ever having to do anything. It's just simply our value systems. It, it's simply the way we are. Um, be honest today to someone, and they don't even expect honesty anymore. Um, I had a product that was sent to my house wrong the other day. I had ordered something else. And so they said, well, you just don't bother sending that back. We'll just send you the new one. I sent the, the, the other one back anyway. Because it's not my property. It belongs to the company that just made a mistake. They made, somebody made a mistake in the delivery room there when they were packing the order. And so they sent the wrong, they sent the wrong stuff to me. Well, that's not my property. Let's send it back. They said, I oh, can keep it. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to send it back to them. Well, that's counterculture. Uh, integrity, honesty. Uh, and then when you look at the praise music, we've talked about this. This is what sets the faithful believers of God apart from everything else. When you li listen to the music of other religions, um, Buddhism and things of that nature, they do all this grinding noise, guttural type singing. Whereas for the praise, it's lifting up. Uh, these others are suppressing, uh, trying to uh, cause a person to punish themselves as they sing. For the Christian, it, it, we're liberated. We're set free. We're like a bird that got out of a cage, and we're going back and just singing everywhere we go. That's what praise is. It's, a, it's an uplifting. And unfortunately, and, and Gary mentioned that, there's a lot of great contemporary music in churches. I, I pastored a church that was fully contemporary, and it was we had a lot of wonderful moments of worship in there but when you get back to the hymns the hymns will teach you things about doctrine and they come right out of the pages of the bible in such a way that 
you're learning something about the nature of God in those forms of praise. And uh, a lot of things today, a lot of worship today is built more around your emotion. What, this is what I want to feel. But when you read those hymns or sing those hymns or just read them, just read the stanzas, they're teaching us something. Holy, holy, holy is teaching us something. It teaches us the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All are holy, and it teaches us the value and the importance of living a holy life. And that God is holy. And there's a lot of things that you just don't hear that today. And I think I told you years ago when I was pastoring another church in the community, uh, we had a big revival that was coming up. And we were a fully uh, contemporary um, worship. And my music minister and I were talking, and I said, we need hymns of invitation. And we need, uh, well, not hymns. We said, we need songs of invita uh, invitation, and we need songs of repentance. And we were fully vested in the contemporary music. And he came back to me and he said, I, after two or three weeks, he said, I can't find any in contemporary music that calls for invitation or calls for repentance. He said, do you mind if I take the hymns and use those? I said, that's fine. So he, he jazzed them up some and had them a little faster pace, but there they were, and we had response. But see, the fact, the words are what's really important in the praise. It's not the beat of the music as much as it is the words. Now, the music should, should be celebratory, and that's what he's saying here. But here, he says, look what he says. He says, we're going to do it in, in, in a culture that's contrary to God. I will sing praises to you, he says, before the gods. So all this false stuff around Babylon, all these things that are trying to tear down their faith, the way they mocked them as they plundered the city, it says in Psalm 137, verse 3, now in Psalm 138, he said, we're going to sing our praises. Now that we're captives in Babylon, we're not going to let that keep us from praising God. Also, praising the Lord, when you praise with a whole heart, W-H-O-L-E, when you praise with a whole heart, is a form of repentance. Because as you sing those praises, you're reinforcing your commitment, but at the same time, you're being challenged. So what are you doing? I need to be more like that, Lord. You know, and I need to be, uh, we sing about, um, Kathy was uh, playing on the piano and to, during the offertory, um, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold is in that song that she was playing this morning. Well, when we sing those words and we mean them, that's a form of repentance. You know, I don't need to pursue wealth. I need to pursue you, Lord. The more I pursue you, the more you'll bless me with what I need. And that, again, is why we sing those hymns and sing those praises, because it's also a form of repentance. So as they're singing praises before the gods of Babylon, what are they doing? They're repenting, and they're now before the living Lord. These are dead gods, these dead idols that they have all surrounded them uh, around Babylon. And what God did when he put them in captivity was to show them that. You know, you turn your back on me, you embrace the gods of this world. So I'm going to put you in an environment where you're surrounded by the gods of this world. Let's see how you value me now. And all these people are praying to these dead idols. And, they're, and we've looked at those in the Psalms of how they have no life. They have no breath. They have no, no substance other than a person's imagination. Now, as they're in the midst of this world that's counterculture to God... And they're now counterculture to their uh, pagan world, the, the Hebrews are. They see that there is a living God. And that's why they praise with a whole heart. The word whole there also means a complete and total reliance. Uh, it's like throwing yourself into the hands of your, of your dad when you were a little kid. And you'd be on something and dad would say, jump down, I'll catch you. I don't know, daddy. No, I'll catch you. I'm not going to drop you. Why would I drop you? I love you. I'm not going to let you hurt. No, I'm going to catch you. And you'd be up in a tree or something. Say, come on, just jump down. I'll catch you. Don't worry. Oh, Dad, I don't want, I'm, I'm afraid to jump down. I don't want to do that. Say, no, come on, son. Trust me. And finally, the kid takes that leap of faith, and Dad catches him, sets him down. Says, no, don't climb up in that tree and do that again. Well, that's, that's a form of a wholeness that he's talking about. It's a total abandonment of self-trust and self-reliance and saying, I, I'm totally relying on you. I'm totally trusting you with my whole heart. Uh, that that my, I'm, I'm 
throwing my whole heart. My heart is in your hands. And the word heart, as we know uh, throughout the scripture, is the mind, the will, and the emotions. So this is every aspect of the person. And as we've noticed, this is the proper order in which we live. We fill our minds with the word of God. We fill our minds with the praise songs. We keep those words in our head. I don't know about you, but a lot of times what we sing on Sunday morning, I start singing on Monday, uh, Monday morning when I get up. I'll start reliving some of those hymns. That's in my mind. It's in your mind. So when the mind starts that way, and that's why we should go to the scripture early on. That's why Jesus prayed early in the morning for a great while before the sun came up, getting his mind in order. Then the will will follow the mind. You'll start doing what your mind's thinking, and then your emotions catch up with it. Because sometimes we start doing stuff, and I don't want to do that. I go for a walk every morning. Well, I don't feel like walking when I get up and start. I'm all crunchy and in a bad mood, and I'm tired, and I'm still rubbing my eyes. I'm like, I'm going to get out here and start doing this. But then the emotions catch up with it later. Boy, you know, I'm glad I went for that walk. It cleared my head and it's helped me feel better. So it's all the same way. And that's what he's talking about here, a whole heart. So he's saying praise of number two. Look what he says. And in the rest of it, he says, I will worship you, worship you towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Uh, second thing we see here is that whole hearts uh, are strengthened by praise. So we find they sing praise, and then when your heart is whole, that means complete, it's going to strengthen your praise, it's going to strengthen your life, it's going to strengthen your prayers, it's going gonna, it's gonna to strengthen everything about your life. So a whole heart uh, has a song, and a whole heart has a strength about it when it's complete in the Lord. The person, you and I, come to a whole heart by coming to christ when we ask jesus to forgive us of our sin that's what we were talking about this morning with the man who had leprosy jesus hugged him before he healed him and the reason he hugged him before he healed him is because the man's heart needed healing before his body needed healing his heart had to be made whole his heart had to be made complete so when you come to the lord the first thing he does is he heals the heart before he heals any other aspect of our lives. Before he can heal relationships, before he can heal even the way we're thinking, our mind, or our will will change, our emotions get healed, he's got to heal the heart first. And the first thing he does is to let you know he has acceptance of you. And he forgives you. And that once your heart is in his hands, he's never going to let go of you. And so that's where we get the idea of being strengthened here. Now look what he says, because this is interesting. He says, I worship you towards your holy temple. Now, who else did that? Daniel did that. When Daniel was in Babylon, he opened the windows and looked towards where Jerusalem was. His heart was still in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon. He's working for the king. He's just like Joseph. He's like second only to the king. But his heart longed to be home in Jerusalem, where he worshiped God, not being surrounded by false gods. But his world had gotten deluded with it. Their hearts had gotten away. The Hebrew people's hearts had gotten away from the living God and began to embrace the Gentile gods. Now they're in the middle of a Gentile center, the most powerful na known nation of the world at that time, the most powerful place. And yet what? Because his heart was in Jerusalem, in Zion, Daniel opened his windows every day and looked in that direction and prayed. And that's the way our hearts are going to have to be the more our culture is deluded with the gods of this world. Our hearts are going to have to be leaning more and more towards the Lord. And so we, we ought to have a desire to come here every time the doors open. Miss Annetta has a desire to be here every time the doors are open. She gets ready. She's ready to come to church because it's where her heart is. It's where, where her heart should be is, is in the presence of the Lord. And he says... Uh, I worship towards your holy temple, and I praise your name. I'm looking in that direction. And what's he doing? He's praising his name. So here again, he says, I praise you with a whole heart. And he says, and then what am I praising you with? I'm praising you with your name. I praise your name. And the name means his character. And then what do we see? Your loving kindness and your truth. That's why those are two aspects of God's name. That describes his name right there. Loving kindness and truth. 
So we have a loving God and we have a truthful God. And this is why he praises his name. That is the name of God. He's loving and he's always truthful. And there's no shadow of turning with him. So he doesn't lie to us and he loves us. No lies and all love. No lies and all love. No lies and all love. That's who the Heavenly Father is. And his no lies and no love sent his only begotten son, Jesus, physical presence of a loving God, a loving Savior who was always truthful. There's no lies and all love in Jesus. He's, a, he's God on earth for us. And that, those, those loves, loves and truth, that love and truth sent to the cross. Because to be truthful with us meant, I love you so much, I have to go to the cross. It's, it, it cannot be ignored. It, it cannot be um, surpassed. We, we have, I have to go to the cross for you. And then he says, and you have magnified your net word above all your name. You've magnified your word. The word is the Bible. Well, that's where we find his truth. And when we find his truth there, we also find his love there. So the word is your Bible. For them, it was the Torah, those first five books of the Bible. And then they're writing down what all these prophets are saying that would become part of what we know now as the Old Testament. So the word is his evidence of his love and his truth. And why? Then you go back to John chapter 1. I reinforce this all the time. That word became flesh. And dwelt among us. That found, was found in Jesus. And because of that, it's proof that what he said in the scripture is true because it was manifest in his son Jesus. And that's how he magnifies his name, is in Jesus Christ. He magnified it, which means he made it greater than already existed. And the only way you can make it greater is to personify it. So it became a person. The Word became a person, and the person became the Word, Jesus Christ. And that's why this is important for us to understand, and it strengthens our faith. As he magnified your Word above all your name, was Jesus is the name above all names. It's what Paul says, his name is above all names. And he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He said, in that day I cried out, and you answered me, and you made me bold with strength in my soul. So it strengthens the prayer and it strengthens the soul. And the soul again comes back to the heart. It strengthened my mind, it strengthened my will, it strengthened my emotions. It saved me. And the word strengthen there means a form of salvation. So the fourth, the third and final thing is that we see with a whole heart you have salvation. And salvation means it rescued me. It rescued me. It rescued them from the the culture, the, the Gentile uh, pagan culture of their world, and see how they've moved counterculture all the way? Jesus is always counterculture because Jesus is the one who's right side up. Jesus didn't come to turn the world right upside down. He came to turn the world right side up because the world's already upside down. So he came to turn the world right side up with his way. So when people always say, well, Jesus came to turn the world upside down, they mean well, but that's terribly wrong. That's the wrong viewpoint. He's right side up. The world's upside down. It's the Poseidon adventure. Everything's upside down. So our praises are counterculture. It's upside down to what the world's doing. The more pagan the world the music becomes, the more ours should become pure. The more pagan the world music is, the more pure ours should be. Why? Because it's calling repentance in the midst of those songs. Because we're always repenting for something. And then second, the counterculture is that when the midst of these gods, what does he say? I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to lift your name up. They swear and curse and cuss using the name of Jesus. That's counterculture. That's, that's paganism when they use a the God's name in vain. That's why God said, don't use my name in vain. Don't use it in an empty fashion. You will not be held guiltless when you do this. So what do we see here is that a whole heart cherishes the name of God, doesn't say uh, disgusting things with his name. He reveres his name 
It, it reverences his name. The whole heart always reverences the name of the Lord, and it strengthens our soul, it strengthens our heart, and we see him as a loving, truthful God. That's his character. And his, that word is that we hold on to, the name of Jesus and the, name, and the word of God is became flesh and dwelt among us and is the way it's magnified his grace is magnified his word is magnified through the person of jesus christ and that's why it's so important for christians to hold dear the name of god to hold dear the word of god to hold dear the people of god because that's what's strengthening our soul it's what strengthens our soul and it magnifies the word and then as a result of that we have salvation because if you look he says I, I cried out and you answered me well anyone who calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved that's not just a new testament concept that's an old testament concept that's fulfilled in the new testament of jesus christ the old covenant said call upon the name of the lord you shall be saved new testament says you call upon the name of the lord jesus and you shall be saved he's the fulfillment he says in my blood is a new covenant that covenant yes built us where we are today jesus is saying and now the new covenant branches out and gives the whole world the opportunity for salvation so you and i walk in that salvation you cried out for god to answer you one day and he did and he made me bold with strength in my soul and that boldness means a great confidence it, it's a it's a it's a determination it's both a resilience and a boldness to overcome to overcome and so we see this aspect of a whole heart as one who overcomes through salvation. So remember, salvation's two things. It's present tense, and uh, it's a sustaining faith and a saving faith. It both sustains us in the present, and it also uh, preserves us for the future. So this faith here that he's talking about is a present, everyday, sustaining faith, and an eternal salvation for heaven that preserves us for all eternity. So that's why we're salt and light, because we've already been salted and put in the light. <laughs> we've been salted like meat. And, <laughs> and, and what? To, to keep us from decay. That's how you preserve meat in those days. You salted the meat. Well, now we are salt. We've been salted by the word of God. We've been salted by the salvation of Jesus. And so we're preserved. Now as preserved people, we spread the salt and light to the world. So that they can find sustaining faith and saving faith for the future, present and future tense. So that's what we see tonight in this uh, psalm. And these first three verses in Psalm 138. We have a great God. So the question is, do you have a whole heart? Or do you have a heart with a hole? If you have a heart with a hole, you need Jesus Christ. And you'll have a whole heart. You'll be made complete. Well, Lord God, we thank you for this night and this time to have together to look into your word, Psalm 138. And we thank you, Lord, in the midst of the Babylonian captivity of the people. A psalm was written to remind them of the fact that they needed to return to you and come back to you. Lord, we have uh, churches all over this country and around the world that's quickly becoming contrast to the world around us. Not because we've changed, but because the world has changed. And the world pressures us to change along with them. Help us, Lord, to remain faithful and true. Faithful and true to your church, faithful and true to your word, and most importantly, faithful and true to our Christ, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we pray that you'll give us the resolve in the midst of uh, this counterculture that we have become and have always been because we're salt and light in a world that takes the easy road help us lord to be true to our our faith and lord help us to be true to your word we ask in christ's holy name amen well thank y'all for being here tonight appreciate it very much i enjoyed that thank you ronnie for coming